our first story, former finance minister said Tekpe has defended his government, his management of government finances under his tenure, explaining that the policy initiatives were the best for the country at the time. Reacting to criticisms that some of the government's rigid economic policies contributed to the NDC's defeat at the 2016 election, he said the policies were actually well thought through and went through the required approval processes. Mr. Tekpe, in an exclusive interview with Joe News' MFA Pau, argued that the fact that the current government has continued with his policy initiatives is proof that they were sound. Every single important measure mm -hmm. that we took yeah. with approval of my bosses, one, went to cabinet, mm -hmm. two, we went to parliament, mm -hmm. sometimes legislation, mm -hmm. and three, you would agree with me that I probably did more media briefs. You did? Well, of course. You know, I did, you know, I was doing media briefs almost every month. Yeah. You know, and espousing many of these things. I must consider many of these things, you know, are, you know, new mm -hmm. to our economic management. Mm -hmm. um, thankfully, I had some exposure, saw what is going on in Eastern Europe, becoming part of EU and working in other countries, Exim Bank and other, you know, initiatives. And, and so um, I felt that I should you know, convince mm. cabinet, and cabinet approved. We went to parliament with many of these things. We passed laws. Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund mm. was debated in parliament. Mm. So there's nothing secret about In the about process it. of introducing some of these <coughs> new uh, policies with your experience and knowing that it is new to our environment, that even you incur the role for some of your party members, that you introduce some austere measures that even led to the defeat of your party. I'm sure some of these issues were raised. You've heard about some of them. Well, I think we should distinguish the <coughs> austere measures, mm -hmm. you know, which arose from the misalignments, uh, you can't perpetually be um, uh, pretending to be giving out subsidies when you are not paying. Exactly. You can't, you know, we couldn't have kept single spine at 70% including arrears, mm -hmm. uh, about 60% excluding arrears, you know, without doing something about it. Uh, we couldn't have, you know, I couldn't have pretended mm -hmm. that crude oil prices were still $99. When it was not. You know, when it has slumped. Because that's what the law required, that we, the price the law required that we use. Mm -hmm. But the price has slumped okay. <laughs> to nearly $40. You know, dollars. Mm -hmm. So why do you give the impression to, you know, uh, Ghanaians, to ministers and others that the money would come when it's not, when going, it's to not come. going to come? You know, so you had to take some difficult measures. And I must say that I think the notion that somehow, you know, my colleagues, you know, were against me, mm -hmm. obviously, you had to convince them. Mm -hmm. And there must be debates, and there was intense debates, either in cabinet, in other places. Okay. And I think it is within their right, you know, to ask, you know, questions. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes all of these things came across, <laughs> you know, as if to say that, you know, they were uh, in opposition to every policy that we implemented. I would say no. It doesn't mean that every single one of them supported every single policy. policy. It doesn't mean that there weren't alternative views as to what should be done. You know, but I think it is within the right of a minister, mind you, within the right of an MP mm -hmm. on our side, who would be facing the constituents, you know, to ask questions and understand the policies. Mm -hmm. In any event, um, I think that um, structural reforms and true structural reforms are often difficult. Yeah. But I must say confidently that the fact that many of these have not been cancelled, mm -hmm. you know, as you know, was promised in many instances, probably attest to the fact that you know these are you know uh, probably sound policies which the nation needs to nurture. Sinking fund is actually part of the new debt management. What you know, uh, you know, we call the smart borrowing, um, and. Let me give you another example of smart borrowing. I gave you an example of yeah. a sinking fund. Mm -hmm. Borrowing and paying principal. Let me reduce it. It's like, you know, uh, you go and borrow from the bank, MFR, to buy a car, you to, buy, to put up a house, to pay school fees. And then you go to the bank and you say, you know, I'm really hard up. So let me be paying interest. I hope I will get time, money someday, to pay the principal. So the bank keeps, you know, 
-hmm. And then you have another problem, you go and you borrow. And you say, oh, like the first time, let me, it will get to a time when even the bank will stop you. You know, because you are borrowing, you are not paying down, okay. you know, the principal. So that's what's sinking fund forever. Another example in our arsenal of uh, debt management, you know, was a practice where government gave a guarantee to, for a loan to a state-owned enterprise mm -hmm. to establish a commercial project, a commercial project. And we all pay for that commercial project. When we visit the airports, we pay airport tax, you know, through when we go to the port, you know, we pay. Mm -hmm. And then instead of the project, which is commercial, paying for the loan, right, government takes over. Why? Because an SOE has fallen because of hippic mainly when we had, you know, borrowing space. Yeah. You're not paying down the debt. You have to put yourself down, your foot down and make all those projects self-financing. It's not new. Mm -hmm. However, it's not new. It's not. I keep saying, Akosomo Dam paid for itself. Original Temahabo paid for itself. You know, through fees that were collected. Mm. So why did we fall into the bad habit of borrowing to do commercial projects and then we ask the taxpayer to pay? We're taking a break here on Joy News Prime, but still ahead in the bulletin, we'll be talking about the Public Utility Workers uh, Union fighting for severance package to be paid the elect electricity company, workers of the electricity company of Ghana. Stay tuned for that. We have a representative of PU we will be speaking with. Stay tuned. We're back in a bit. Now, the Public Utility Workers Union is demanding that government commit to awarding workers of the Electricity Company of Ghana a severance package before the company is taken over by the concessionaire under the Millennium Challenge Compact. At a news conference on Tuesday at the Trade Union Congress building here in Accra, the leadership of PU explained the labor law requires that the workers of ECG are adequately compensated before the takeover. The request for severance somewhat contradicts Poole's insistence in the last couple of years that governments include assurances in the Millennium Challenge Compact that the workers would not be laid off en masse once the new company takes over. Now, the Public Utility Workers Union organized uh, quite a number of news conferences across the country in the Ashanti region. They said governments could have avoided the current situation if it had adopted some of the privatization options Poo proposed, explaining that the intended arrangement will ultimately result in the legal termination of the employment relations that exist between the staff and ECG. Now, Noel Arthur McLean is the National Division Youth Representative, and he was speaking after they addressed the media in the Ashanti region. For our part, we want to sound the government that we shall use all legitimate means to protect and defend the interests of workers of ECG. The battle lines have just been drawn. Our demand is pay us our severance package now. Yes. I am repeating that. Yes. Our demand is pay us our severance package now. We are not against the compact in principle. But we strongly object to the option of a concession as the model of the PSD for ECG. We have consistently maintained that the solution to the challenges facing ECG are within the domain of governments. And it is in a lazy and indisciplined approach to think that it is only through private sector participation that ECG can be turned around. On the issue of service, while we are certain that that's why all good intentions and cooperation demonstrated by management, the answer to the question of payment of severance is not within the hands of ECG management. Accordingly, we are calling on the Ministry of Energy and thus the government of Ghana as a matter of agency to demonstrate its commitment to the respect of the rights of the individual workers of ECG. We believe a joint venture of ship involving ECG and the selected private partner can address all their anxieties and provide a win-win results. 
Uh, in the central region, the Public Utility Workers Union say the entire trade union congress is in support of the demands being made on behalf of the workers of the Electricity Company of Ghana. Regional Council Chairman of Poo, Enoch Paul Hayes, addressed the media. Those who are not with ECG are here just to show the concerns that we are not happy with the way things are going. We are saying that we want our severance. If the government wants to go ahead and therefore implement the compact and do whatever they want to do, it belongs to them. But we are saying that as workers of ECG, we have worked with the company. We have had a part of it. They should pay everybody their severance. We are not going to wait till the compact is implemented before they pay us. We have seen examples in other other companies. Then either they finish, they don't pay you, or they have. We want our severance now before the new company comes to take over. That is all we want to sell the president. And this is going straight to the president. That is our humble appeal. The uh, TUC has made an effort, but the minister is not showing up at any time we make the effort. He's not ready to listen to us because we wanted to have an engagement to at least explain to him and tell him some of the things the workers are expecting from them. And it's not been done. What we are saying is that um, it is long overdue because we expect this step to be taken by now. If they really want to look to the compact, they should also look at the workers. And we are saying that the guarantee is not mentioned. Even though the president mentioned on the May Day that they will not sack anybody, and they, they, will, they, will, they are reducing the 25 years to, to 20 years, and all this stuff, we have not seen document. The word is that we have not seen any document attesting and confirming the statement. And what we are saying is that we have the next step to take. They will, they will definitely hear of us, because what we are saying is that you can see the whole TUC affiliate are here. So that tells you that now the numbers are not only pool. This is not only ECG. It's becoming a battle for the whole working staff of Ghana. And then we want the country to know the president should not sit down on this matter. We are calling on him. He should rise up and say something concerning ECG concession. And therefore, we need our severance. Right, so joining me in the studio is a member of uh, the Public Utility uh, Workers Union. He's actually Isaac Yaute Ako Jr. and he's the Senior Industrial Relations Officer. He's going to be explaining to us exactly what the ECG or they're asking for on behalf of the electricity uh, company of Ghana workers. Thank you for making time to join us in the studio. Now, I want to understand, there's been a number of... Uh, events or news conferences being held across the country. What's, what's the whole idea? Thank you very much, Israel. Let me also take this opportunity to say good evening to your cherished viewers. Um, on the issue of the activities, I think today we decided to hold a regional council. A regional council uh, is one structure or one arm of the Public Utility Workers Union where decisions are also taken. So today, the uh, regional council that we had, it was held almost in all the uh, operational regions within the catchment area of Public Utility Workers Union. And it comprises of ECG, Ghana Water, State Housing, Community Water. You know, the solidarity is there. Uh, it happened to Ghana Water, and now it's ECG. So probably we need to also take steps to really make sure that some of these things don't continue. The idea of this meeting today was not actually a press conference, though. It was a picketing that we tell the government, our message in today's activity, which happens to be the picketing, is that we need our severance now. I think that's the long and short of our message. OK, so the ECG workers are asking for severance package. Why a severance package? They, they have employment. They, they're working with ECG. Why are they asking for severance? I think from the look of things, when this issue started, conversation came, I think the union made a lot of input into the compact. But at the end of the day, I don't mean that we had meetings with them. We also let them know what the union also has in terms of making an input into the compact. But at the end of the day, nothing was taken. And even when the new government also took over, I think the energy ministry, which happens to be a liaison between the ECG and the presidency, there has been a number of times that we've written, written letters to the minister for us to even sit down and dialogue. I mean, we can't actually take the law into our own hands and do so. Anything that we do, basically, the essence of trade unionism, one cardinal point of it is dialogue. 
So if there is not an avenue for us to really sit down and really dialogue and address issue, and um, out of nowhere, you come and tell us that maybe a new company is taking over. It, it isn't out of nowhere. I mean, <laughs> we've known about the fact that about this concession arrangement for some years now. So it isn't something that has been sprung on you as a surprise. You knew that this was going to happen. And indeed, you have been making demands in the last few years that you, as in workers of the electricity company of Ghana, be guaranteed their jobs such that they're not going to be fired by the... Uh, new company that takes over and you have been given that so why I'm trying to reconcile your demands for job guarantee or post demand for job guarantee for ECG workers and now your new call for a severance package yeah I'm happy. do you do you want your jobs or do you want the severance package you it must be either is I, I I I don't know what you might you might have a document that actually shows the first time we heard this message was during the May Day, when the president said that the 25 years has been reduced to 20 years, and that there's not going to be any laid off within that period. In the first. So what shows? So you want some guarantee. You want some Something guarantee on paper. and commitment on paper. Despite the president's word. Oh, yes. The president has given you his word. We understand. We respect the president. All right. So is it the commitment you want on paper? from the president that your jobs are guaranteed or, or the severance package? One, the commitment on the part of the government that within the 20 years, there's not going to be any laid off. Then we understand. Then in going forward, if probably we are not also assured, the commitment will be an aspect or one part of it which will also give us the assurance and the guarantee that, okay, going into the 20 years, at the end of the day, there will not be any a sort of layoff. And here we are. There's nothing like that. We've written letters upon letters, a reminder. Even when the energy minister came into office, we requested for a meeting or engagement with the union to now we've not eliminated. Mr. Ako Jr., so, I, I, I want a, a firm word from you. What are you asking for? Do you want these guarantees put down on paper or you want a severance package? As we speak now, there's nothing on paper. So now we are demanding for so the payment of our severance. That's what we are demanding for now. All right. So if you get the commitment on paper, you will withdraw your demands for the severance. No, no. What we get, you will know the next action to take. But now that there's nothing to assure us or to guarantee our employment, we are calling on the government that you pay us our severance now. Failing which, what do you intend to do? I think we'll take it one after the other and pay our press release we actually alluded that we use all legitimate means to make sure that the servants of the workers are also. There, I heard some of your colleagues in the regions talking about the fact that you're not going to be uh, working uh, sometime tomorrow. How exactly is that playing out, the ECG workers? Um, I think as part of the activity, sure, we had a picketing today. Tomorrow, it's just going to be, we'll work throughout the day, but all that, we'll have one, or one hour, uh, a demonstration, which are, I know the, the last time we had two so hours. So you wouldn't be working for one hour? Yeah, just one hour. It's important that this is put out so that the people who will be visiting, the customers of ECG who will be going to the various regional offices are aware, or the various offices of ECG are aware. So can you make that clear? Well, just a demonstration among the workers, but there will be other special areas who will be carrying out their duty. At, at what time of day are you Just looking at? Just 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock. 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock. Just a small, it's not really a big or uh, much of a time. All right. So that was uh, Isaac Yaute Ako Jr. He's a senior industrial relations officer at the Public Utilities Workers Union. And he's indicating that the ECG workers are not going to be working for about one hour on Wednesday, it says between 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock. So if you intend to go to any of the ECG offices, uh, you have been served notice that you're likely to encounter some disruption in their work. Thank you very much for making the time. Now, in other news, the entire commission of the National Development Planning Commission has resigned after developing the 40-year development plan aiming to guide the management of resources for a holistic development of the country. The Professor Kwesi Botre led commission developed the document expected to guide successive governments in their planning and execution of set goals. At a short ceremony at the Flagstaff House, a draft document highlighting key points of the document was presented to President Ekufuado. 
Finally, Mr. President, um, a special transport infrastructure framework. We intend to have frameworks covering about eight other sectors, including sanitation uh, and uh, energy and all that. We haven't quite had the time to do all eight of them. Finally, this is work in progress, Mr. President. We can't deign to suggest that we've written everything. We have put the plan documents in as close to completion as possible. But we recognize that it may require further review, further work, and we are happy as a group to help in any way we can to bring to complete such review if necessary. And now our work having been done, Mr. President, this was the most important part of our mission. We, as a commission, chaired by me, Mr. President, would like to collectively, Mr. President, stand down, bring our tenure as a commission to a close. Not so much because any law or statute or constitution requires us to, but in order to give you, Mr. President, the opportunity to recompose, recast the commission in accordance with your own vision and priorities, as well, Mr. President, as the supreme interest of our country. Well, it turns out the government has its own seven-point strategy to develop the country. The document detailing it will be presented to Parliament for consideration after receiving approval from Cabinet. But President Kufuadu nonetheless said his government will study the content of the 40-year development plan for implementation. Without preempting the contents of the plan, I should state some of my own aspirations. Firstly, that we will have a strong, buoyant economy that will provide decent jobs for all. And that our school leavers from secondary and university will not spend an inordinate amount of time as they do now to get a job or create one for themselves and for others. Secondly, that being a Ghanaian will be associated with tangible benefits such as free basic education, a good health care system, the rule of law, and security in the country. Thirdly, that reciprocally, citizens will ex exude levels of discipline and professionalism that engender efficiency in the management of our institutions and the development of our society. Fourthly, that our infrastructure effectively supports our development with the range of options in road, rail, air, and water forming a complex network across the entire country. Fifthly, that we will be mindful of our planet, the Earth, and as global citizens, ensure that we act in a manner to guarantee its health and survival. Sixthly, that our institutions, public and private, function as expected and consciously work to the satisfaction of citizens. And seventh, that Ghana is fully engaged in efforts towards regional and continental integration. I can fully appreciate that achieving all these will take a lot of planning and efficiency in orchestrating actions and programs, and also a reasonable length of time to conclude the path that we charter. We must figure out together with all the major stakeholders how we can achieve this. And I'm reassured that these aspirations meet substantially those of the plan you are submitting, that we all agree that we must build a Ghana beyond aid. All right, we're taking a break to bring you business news, but there, today at the Flagstaff House, uh, the president let out a certain laughter, which is likely to be developed into a meme in the coming days. And uh, it's not very often you hear the president laugh in public, and so we'll be sharing that laughter with you later on in the bulletin. It's classic. We want to stay tuned for that. Business News is next.
Hello, good evening to you. Welcome to Business. Chief Executive of the Ghana Investment Promotion Center, Yofi Grant, has been responding to concerns by retail traders over the foreign invasion of local retail markets. The GIPC board says government is seeking some alternatives for local traders to eventually own manufacturing businesses and partner other multinationals rather than permanently staying on the retail business. Some members of the Ghana Union of, Tra of Traders, Ghana Union of Traders, Guta, have threatened to boycott their tax obligations due to failure of government to evict foreign retailers from the market. However, in an interview with Joy Business, Yofi Grant said local traders will be empowered to partner multinationals and create large-scale businesses of their own. We are very clear that we want to build a Ghana that is by Ghanaians for Ghanaians. And so we want to promote our Ghanaians um, to do business here. So even as we go out looking for investors, we look for investors who would partner Ghanaians. I mean, some of the recommendations that I am putting forward uh, for the bigger picture is that maybe in future, um, companies that will get incentives uh, or get the bigger incentives are those who have partnered with Ghanaians. Um, what we need to do is also uplift our, our Ghanaian business people. Uh, we don't want only to be left at tabletops. We want to own shops. We want to own the manufacturing companies. We want to own the economy. And nonetheless, I mean, notwithstanding that we have investors here, we also want to see Ghanaians grow. I mean, there is no reason. We've been exporting gold and cocoa for more than 200 years. We don't even have one single billionaire out of that. That cannot be satisfactory. But we also need to manufacture such that our traders would not only sell goods that are imported, but goods that we make. And then when they sell our goods, we protect them and give them the incentives to even become bigger. At the end of the day, we want our people to benefit, but we also want them to be the ones who create the opportunity and benefit. So that come 10 years, come 15 years, we'll have Ghanaian billionaires, we'll have Ghanaian millionaires who can also then invest in the rest of the sub-region. So yes, there is a concern. But unfortunately, Ghana the government partners everybody. So so far as you do business and you walk on the streets and you live in Ghana, you have to pay taxes. Um, and we expect that um, in every system you have people who um, probably misunderstand how important taxes is. So taxes are, and so would um, find ways and means not to um, do that. But that is why we have we are trying to digitize the economy such that we even make it easier for people to engage government and be able to pay taxes. And also, better care for the public purse. Because when there is no good care for the public purse, then people get annoyed that, well, I'm working, I'm paying taxes, but I don't see that the money that I'm, I'm working being put to good use. So we need to take better care of the public purse. Away from that, Stambik Bank has launched a Purchasing Managers Index, PMI, aimed at helping investors understand the business trends. Managing Director of the bank, Al Hassan Andani, revealed the launch of the PMI will go a long way to improve data collection and information sharing within the financial sector. Here's more in this report. The Purchasing Managers Index is based on a monthly survey of carefully selected companies representing major and developing economies worldwide. The index provides an advanced signal of what is really happening in private sector economies by tracking variables such as output, new orders, employment and prices. Al Hassan Andani is the Managing Director of Stabic Bank. Um, we want to be able to provide market-driven indicators which typically your foreign investors uh, like which are timely because most of your official data comes out quarterly you know maybe semi-annually and annually the PMI comes out on a monthly basis so it, it's an early indicator of how things are going and it's also market based we actually go to the real operators in the market and ask them these relevant questions and take their response and then ship some early indication of how things are trending and, and, and where we've gotten to as a middle income uh, country, it's important that we are able to, to, to do this. On his part, Executive Director of Economic Indices of HRS Market, Richard Willis, said the launch of the PMI was timely as it would go a long way to boost investor confidence in the country. Now, the PMI is about giving the first indicator each month of, of business conditions. So we're very aware that you know we need to talk to everybody within the country company, uh, the company, my apologies, within the country, um, just to get a representative sample um, of 
across the, across the whole country. So we will talk to um, a small restaurant employing three or four people because if the economy is doing better, um, you know, there's a quite a likelihood that people will go out to lunch more often, dinner more often, um, and then up to the very largest companies. So it is to get a feel at the, for the first time each month of what the economy is doing so people can make decisions more quickly um, and, and feel that there is something coming out there on a monthly basis saying what are the twists and the turns in the economy. The PMI is the only comprehensive source of sector economic data and because the surveys are based on facts, they produce highly reliable economic indicators. In addition to providing national economic indicators, PMI data are always available for detailed sectors of the economy, allowing specific industry trends to be monitored on a global basis. Now, the Procurement and Supply Chain Management Department under the head of the Civil Service is to hold the 5th Annual Procurement and Supply Chain Summit in Accra. The event, which comes off from Wednesday, 27th September, is expected to bring together procurement prof professionals and supply chain experts under the theme, Effective Public Procurement as a Tool for Job Creation. The Acting Director of the Procurement and Supply Chain Management Department, Ebenezer Sleepy Baden, has been, has been explaining the rationale behind this year's summit. That we organize every year to bring together procurement practitioners in both the private and the public sector to discuss relevant and prevailing national issues in the supply chain arena, particularly in relation to public procurement. The government of the day is pushing to create employment opportunities for a lot of Ghanaians and for that matter, the teaming unemployed youth. So we have the view that as procurement and supply chain professionals in the public service, we have a role to play, be it in the various programs that the government is introducing. For example, if you take the one district, one factory, one village, one dam project, we believe that we can contribute effectively in these areas. And so the, the theme that if procurement, and for that matter public procurement is handled properly, it could help in creating jobs, particularly implementing the public procurement law and other international procurement regimes. Now, Ghana is set to make huge economic gains during the upcoming African Air Expo. The African Air Show will be the first aerospace and aviation exhibition in West Africa and hopes to bring together major stakeholders within the aviation industry to discover latest developments within the sector. The Minister for Aviation, Celia Dapa, has been explaining the benefits of the maiden edition of the Air Show to be hosted in Ghana. The exhibition will take place from the 24th to the 26th of October. The Aerospace and Aviation Exhibition for West Africa scheduled for October hopes to bring together major players in the aviation industry. In all, about 150 companies providing aviation-related services are expected to display latest innovations in the sector and foster business partnerships. Aviation Minister Cecilia Dapa said the country stands to reap significantly from this event. All these airlines that operate in Ghana, they are flying in means they are coming as business people, investors, as well as tourists. They are not coming for these three days to be here only. I'm sure they will sleep in hotels, they will eat Ghanaian food, they will drink, they will be, make themselves merry, all in Ghana. And I believe with 3,000 people conservatively coming in, it could be more, I think we stand to gain a lot in uh, tourism as well as in investments from the participants and the stakeholders. The air show has been organized in partnership with 4M Events. 4M Events General Manager Didier Marie explains to Joy Business why the organization settled on Ghana to host the program. We choose Ghana because uh, we were looking for a democratic country, a safe country, and we were looking for the West Africa because uh, if you're looking at the map of Africa, um, you will see that most of the airline need to do a stopover before they go in Atlantic or if go to Europe. So we pick Ghana because uh, 
is one of the fastest growing country in aviation. The air show will be held at the Kutuka International Airport and will accommodate over 60 aircrafts. Managing Director for the Ghana Airports Company Limited assures that they are poised to host the event successfully. We expect that with this, we are going to open the aviation industry in Ghana to those people in other parts of the world who may not have heard or may not have known what really goes on here. Day in day out, there are investors who are exploring and asking questions about us. And we think that this is an opportunity to put it all together in one place to show people that really we are ready. And that if they wanted to take advantage of all the things going on in this country, they could come here. We have a new terminal coming up. Our airspace is very safe. Our runway is not as busy now to say that there's congestion and therefore new airlines are not re uh, invited. Tamale is coming up. We are going to put up a new terminal building, the same in Kumasi. And it's important that people come here to feel and see it. Sometimes you can hear all the stories, but when you get here and get the real feel, then you can say to yourself, yes, this is a country I want to invest in. Running in parallel with the exhibition, there will be conferences organized during the three-day event. That's all by way of business tonight. Many thanks for your company. My name is Emmanuel Abuaji Riafe. For more business news, log on to mindjohnonline.com slash business. Have a good evening. A maternal mortality at the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital is back on the rise after an initial dip at the beginning of the year. Public support to the hospital in response to Joy News' special assignment documentary next Jedi is credited with the improvement. Authorities, however, say the progress was short-lived. Acting Chief Executive Dr. Ohneba Uusudanso told a media review meeting, though delivery at the facility dropped by 18% over last year's, debts shot up. Love News' is Kwesi Debra reports. Women who gave birth at the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital in half year reduced from 5,250 in 2016 to 4,263 in 2017. Deaths, however, went up slightly from 791.38 per 100,000 live births to 985.22 per 100,000 live births over the same period. Dr. Usidansu blames the trend, among other factors, on patients arriving late at the hospital when they are in crisis stage. At the period under review, we had a lower attendance comparatively in terms of uh, pregnant women uh, using the facility. And yet within the same period, in terms of uh, mothers or women who died through birth-related uh, uh, diseases, shot up. One would have expected naturally that uh, with the attendance or the numbers of utilization dropping, the, the death rate should also drop. But we had uh, an overshoot. And for me, I think that was uh, not a very good reflection. Of course, there are various reasons that account for this. And that is the issue that I spoke about. The Confonochi has increasingly over the years become an, a facility of utilization as a last resort. That most people who are coming here are people who are coming in at the very terminal stages of their illnesses. And that's the reason why we have very high mortalities. <laughs> Dr. Usudansu acknowledges First Lady Rebecca Kufuado and the multimedia group's effort in the construction of a new mother and baby unit. He, however, believes expedited action on the 40-year-old stored maternity block project will offer more permanent solution. When we have new accidents and new emergency coming in, then it actually encumbers the emergency operational area, which is not the best for us for patient care. And the reason why the mother baby unit, um, I keep talking about it, and that despite the intervention, which is very, very critical, that the First Lady has made for us now, as a country, we must look forward to make sure that the 40-year-old facility is completed. Reporting for Joy News, Kwesi Deb. The Ghana Health Service says there has been an improvement in the use of contraceptives, but would still want to encourage more Ghanaians to subscribe to the use of family planning methods. Deputy Director General of the Service, Dr. Gloria Kwanzaa-Sare, says the move will not only help prevent unwanted pregnancies, but also enhance the nation's development. She was speaking at an event to mark World Contraceptive Day. Journey Susana Ayoko Ejei has more. 
World Contraceptive Day is celebrated each year to create awareness to enable young people make informed choices about their sexual reproductive health. Here in Ghana, the target is to get most of the adult population to use contraceptives by 2020. But to achieve this, Deputy Director of the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Gloria Kwanzaa-Sari says, family planning must be made more attractive. These celebrations are therefore important as we strive to achieve a national target of 50% for contraceptive prevalence by the year 2020. According to, to the 2014 demographic, Ghana Demographic and Health Survey, the use of modern contraceptive methods among married women is 22%. Since women in our country stand a better chance of changing their status and well-being through improved access to reproductive health services, including family planning, we should persist in our efforts to dispel all myths and misconceptions to make family planning desirable to all, including men. Although a Ghana Health Service survey shows the country is making progress, the United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA, says concrete measures should be taken to address some challenges bedeviling the adoption of family planning. Ghana has committed to increasing our modern CPR, our contraceptive prevalence rate, to 30% amongst married and 40 amongst unmarried sexually active women by 2020. I am happy to note that the Ghana Health Service is already reporting CPR of 33% at key meetings, including the recently held Health Summit. Launched in 2007, this year's World Contraceptive Day was celebrated on the theme Family Planning, Know Your Body, Know Your Partner, Know Your Option. In a related development, the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection says it is committed to helping traditional authorities in the central region fight teenage pregnancy and early marriages. Deliberating on the role stakeholders should play in the fight against the menace, Director of Gender at the Ministry, Reverend Dr. Comfort Asari, assured Chiefs of Government's will to support capacity building as well as provide the necessary resources to aid the campaign to eliminate such practices in the region. Central Regional Correspondent Richard Kojunyako was there for journeys. Teenage pregnancies and early marriages have been key developments that have been curtailing the ambitions of young girls. They drop out of school and in most cases do not go back to school after the marriages and pregnancies. The Department of Gender says it is deeply concerned and will work assiduously to deal with the situation. Critical stakeholders in the fight against teenage pregnancy are traditional authorities, according to the director of the Department of Gender, Reverend Dr. Comfort Asari. We are inspiring them and encouraging them to fight the menace of early and child marriage and also to make sure that teenage pregnancy is minimized. So that is why we've brought traditional leaders together, because we know that in their various communities, they are respected and people hold them in high esteem. So we believe that when they take up the task of sensitizing their people, they will listen. And together we shall minimize early and child marriage, if not eradicate it, and also teenage pregnancy. The Department of Gender is hopeful that if the traditional authorities play their roles very well, the menace of early marriages and teenage pregnancies would be reduced. This meeting is one of the things the department is doing. Some of them didn't know that these were issues that needed to be addressed. So um, we have brought them together and told them these are issues that need redress. So they should initiate programs, activities in their various communities and make sure that they sensitize the people, especially parents and the girls, on what we have shared with them today. And also they should make sure that they link up with schools and follow up on children who are 
becoming wayward or who are not regular at school or who have challenges at home so that they identify the parents or homes that have issues and that the girls who are growing up there are likely to fall out of school for them to meet with the parents, dialogue with them, find out what their problems and challenges are, and see how they can help them. MC from Fansman Kenneth Kelly Suman says the assemblies are upping their games to ensure that the practice is brought under control. He indicates that the assemblies will help the traditional authorities to ensure that the battle is fought and won. What we are suggesting is that the chiefs, the traditional council, should take their proper role when they play their proper role and then um, support the assemblies to implement the bylaws of the various MMDC, uh, MMDAs, we are sure that um, these menace will be nipped in the bud. Some queen mothers who attended the program spoke to Joy News. My name is Nana Kobiwa Akwa the third. I'm the queen mother of Bosume in the Kwamankasi traditional area. I think the main concern is how to keep the kids busy after school. We need to develop a lot of after school programs that will keep the kids busy because like he says, idle hands find things to do. So if we keep them busy either through education, which is after school, there should be something like a centre, like an educational centre where the kids will go and do their homework and get involved with uh, like sports, uh, things like that, that will keep them busy and keep them off the street and that will avoid pregnancy. All right, I want you to watch this. <laughs> <laughs> Are uh, united in our support of the market economy. <laughs> All right, if you're wondering what, got, what was it that got the president laughing out so loud, just stay for a few more minutes. For now, though, we'll take a break to bring you international news. Now, moving on to our, one of our top stories, the fate of scores of uh, students of Premier College whose performance fell below par now hangs in the balance as the school authorities are torn between letting them go or making them repeat Form 1. Now, we have uh, joining us live from Premier College, Ohim Interior, who has been following this story. It happens that uh, the, the students fi find themselves in a pretty tight situation. Ohiming is going to be telling us all about that. Now, Ohiming, I would want us to walk us through why we have found ourselves uh, at such a situation. Really, it has to do with these uh, students uh, who are in the second year, but it turns out that they may not, they are not making it into the second year, yet the school authorities are torn between repeating them or dismissing them. Explain to us what this whole, is, this whole story is about. Thank you, Lisa. This has been a uh, the right terminal exams or end of term exams, and the students are graded based on their performance. But unfortunately, these students who were admitted, uh, I'm told, have failed in successive uh, end of term exams at Prempe College. Uh, some have recorded. Uh, F9, uh, five F9 in five subjects. Uh, some are even uh, have recorded five and uh, seven fields. Uh, this means they have filled in seven subjects uh, at Prempe College. So authorities took this decision uh, to repeat them. But coming into force of the senior high school uh, policy, which allows students to be admitted in public schools uh, free of charge at the first. Uh, these uh, students uh, in class and uh, when knowing very well that Ministry of Education officials will come around to do monitoring. So this has been the headache of uh, to the students, especially their guardians and parents, uh, uh, asking them to see uh, the assistant headmaster in charge of academics. And some of the letters I, I chance on uh, read as yes. Uh, we are sorry to inform you that your guide and your, 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 your student has been repeated or withdrawn from the school. 
and we are to see the assistant uh, headmaster in charge of academic for further discussions. Uh, so this is what uh, brought all these uh, conversations. And as of this morning, when I, uh, I entered, I visited uh, Prempe Kali to see how things were moving, the uh, school head, uh, or headmaster had already been summoned into a meeting with the regional uh, director. And the uh, officials uh, were not happy with the way the headmaster uh, went about the issue because they expected him to inform the regional education directorate before even implementing uh, uh, this uh, uh, arrangement. So I spoke to the public relations officer, Cassandra Chum Ampofo. Uh, let's take a listen to what she told me. We heard media reports that 51 students have been dismissed from Pempe College. Since we didn't know anything about it as a directorate, the regional director of education invited the headmaster to find out the truth. And then when he came, he also confirmed to us. And after a long chat, we decided to have a board meeting on Thursday. And so that's what we're going to do, so that management will finally take a decision on that. Well, according to the headmaster, these students had failed consistently. And so, per that, they decided to repeat them. But because they thought um, the policy, the free SHS policy states that no student is to be charged even a PESWA, they thought that they cannot stay in Form 1 because they just can't also take the school fees from them. And so, some parents decided to take their awards out of the school. So as I speak to you, some have decided to take their awards. Others are also on campus still waiting for the final decision. We have administrative procedures and then we'll be looking at that later. It could it be sanctioned for him for bringing the, the name of the directorate into this dispute? Well, for now, we have not decided on what to do yet. All right, Ohiming, I am aware that the Regional Education Directorate has been meeting with authorities of Premier College. What came out of this meeting? Yes, Israel. Uh, at the meeting, the fate of these 51 students uh, were discussed, and uh, as the public relations officer said, the board of directors will be meeting on Thursday to discuss uh, this issue further. But I'm reliably informed that these students, as it stands now, will not be withdrawn from Pempe College. The education directorate, uh, the regional director for education, for instance, a member of the board. So uh, at this meeting, she will be pushing for the reinstatement uh, of these students, the 51 students, and to, in addition to the others who, are, who should have been promoted to Form 3. So All right, we do apologize for the break in the live uh, broadcast there. Even though Heming is standing by, we can't uh, quite hear him. But he, he has been speaking, or Heming too has been speaking with the Students' Representatives Council. They have waded into this uh, conversation. And let's hear what they have to say. Heming, do stand by for us. Well, we don't have any, anything against them. In fact, it's, it's just an appeal uh, that we are putting out there. Um, you look at the situation and you know very well that Indeed, uh, it's, it's a die one, and indeed, we as Students' uh, Representative Council are a bit concerned about the fate of 51 students at uh, Prempe College. You see, had it been the previous years, it wouldn't have been any news at all. Yes, if students don't perform and uh, you want to uh, repeat them, it's no news. But here it is. I mean, there's an era of the free uh, senior high school implementation, and so it looks like these students cannot be uh, repeated to form one because they may have to pay fees and that is not allowed under the free SHS. What, what happens if these students will be allowed, be given a second chance so that the students will prove themselves that indeed they are worth it? Because if they will be allowed to repeat, so most of the parents we interact with have no problem with the students repeating, but it's the policy that does not allow for payment of school fees. And so either government absorbs them into the free senior high school policy or they are asked to withdraw. And that is the second option that I believe that Prempe would want to. And for me, we feel that this particular situation, it's not the best. And so we call on authorities to reconsider their decision. All right. So, Ohiming, uh, good to have you back on. And I hope uh, this time the line doesn't fail us. I would want to understand 
so all this can, can be actually resolved if the regional education directorate or government just intervenes and says, well, you can charge fees, right? That's right. For now, we are not talking about payment of uh, fees. Education uh, calling for a national debate on what should happen to uh, students who are likely to be repeated uh, in their various schools because uh, they say that this will be a test case uh, as far as uh, the free senior high school education policy is concerned and they believe that these are some of the excesses and they want the ministry to address this and the, the education directorate the regional education directorate also foresee uh, similar circumstances similar situations happening in the region so they will be also meeting heads of uh, educational institutions in the ashanti region especially uh, the public ones where they will be able to discuss what they can do uh, in the future to prevent such occurrences in the Ashanti region, Israel. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ohiming Tuya, for, join, for joining us uh, live from Kumasi with this uh, particular story. And as he indicated, this is likely to be the problem that's uh, recurring in most of uh, the schools, the government assisted schools. And so we're inviting you to join us as in send in your comments if you have similar situations happening in your schools or you have wards in such schools and you're facing a similar situation share with us on our social media platform so we can pass them on to the appropriate authorities for some action to be taken so because once this is decided for premier college it can stand uh, the t as a test or the standard for all the schools that have been affected Staying with the Shanti region, the police command has arrested and transferred to the headquarters in Accra, serial, serial NDC serial caller Kweku Apia, popularly known as Apia Stadium. Police will not give details or reasons for the arrest, except to say they acted on communication from Accra. There is speculation the outspoken NDC supporter who crossed carpet from the MPP was picked up for tagging President Akufado as a drug addict in an audio recording circulating on social media. Ashanti Regional Police Public Relations Officer ASP Juliana Obing spoke to Love News' Nana Aljima. Well, confirmed that we this morning here in Ashanti region arrested one Ghanaian or a Ghanaian or a guy named Kukwapia, popularly known as uh, Apia Stadium. As I speak to you, he's being transferred to National CID headquarters. Um, we, are, we are learning that um, he says some things on toward um, about the president, how she is that. His reason for being arrested and every other communication or details on his arrest should be done by my colleague or my colleagues in Accra or the National CID headquarters where he presently is being transferred to. I say that because well, we are not going to do the investigation here and so it won't be appropriate that we give you reasons why um, he has been arrested. But like I already mentioned, why he's been arrested and all of, all of other questions that he needs answers to should be or will be answered by my colleague at the CID headquarters. Okay. Can, can you give us how you arrested him? Well, I think I can only confirm again that yes, this morning the Ashanti River Police Command arrested Kwekwapia alias Kwekwapia. Now, final year students of the nursing training college were have given governments a one-week ultimatum to include them in the payment of allowances for trainee nurses. According to them, governments have started the process to pay allowances for their junior colleagues who are in the first and second years. The nursing training college were final year students trainee stormed the Upper West Regional Coordinating Council demanding to know why they have been excluded from the payment of the allowances. Join us as Upper West Regional Correspondent Rafiq Salam reports from one. The students numbering 30 from Nathan Training College were riding while tooting the horns of their motorbikes, stormed the Upper West Regional Coordinating Council. Their mission was simple to seek audience with the Upper West Regional Minister, Alaji Suleiman Al Hassan, and to know why government is excluding them from the Nathan Trainee Allowance it promised them during the electioneering campaign. According to them, government has started a process to pay allowances for their junior colleagues 
who are in their first and second year by asking them to submit to them before the close of the week detail of their bank accounts and national health insurance identification card. They are however surprised that they are excluded from the exercise and has now become a laughing stock. Yaya Giba to lie speaks for the group. Even people that just came today, yes. they were included yeah. and somebody just come and pay your admission, uh, your allowance form. Um, we were roaming in this school for the past two yes. years. Meanwhile, our father, the president, promised us that yes. 100 days, 100 million. Yeah. We, I am the Tesco Wukom of my school. Okay. That's MPP. Yes. I'm the Wukom. Yeah. So up to date, people mm. are still asking me, yes. what is your president doing about, about it? I said, it. my president is working on it. Yes. But it came to a time that I have no more answers for mm. him. Now it is in. And we are so exempted. I don't know what to do. They are just confused. We want to hear from him and let it reach him that we are not just happy. Upper was regional minister. Alhaji Suleiman Al Hassan, in his response, told the students that they will never renege on their campaign promise and will do everything possible to ensure that they deliver. Grandpa, NTC were also in my house. They came to their house, and fortunately for them, I called Accra in their presence, and they said they were working on your issue, and that they will soon hear. If you want, you can call your colleagues and find out from Grandpa that they were working on yours and that you soon hear from them. But your coming is good. It will also push me to find out again what is happening so that they can quicken the pace for you. You can also enjoy your bit before you leave the system. So we promise that we will not rest, we will not sleep with it. We will do our best so that you will get your share of the thing before you leave. The Nelson students agreed with the regional minister but warned that they will hit the streets if their demand is not met after a week. We were the very people that they made that promise to that. Yes. If we yes. vote them yes. in the power, yes. definitely we'll get yes. So we are looking we up to them. The we, we brought about the change. So we, if we do not get any positive yes. response, in we fact, we will hit the streets of this you nation and, and demonstrate welcome. against we, it. We know. Reporting for Joy News, Rafik Salam. Wow. All right, so now I'd ask uh, my producer to bring you the presidential laughter that I told you about, the short one, David. Are <laughs> 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 uh, united in our support of the market economy. <laughs> All right, so President Okufado let out the loud laughter when he shared a joke with members, when members of the National Development Planning Commission called on him at the Flagstaff House on Tuesday. Let's just listen to what exactly the president said before he let out that law. Ghana is very grateful to you. And I hope that the rest of you will not mind if I single out in particular my old friend and contemporary from our undergraduate days at Legon, Dr. Kwesi Butri. I didn't know how to a, a traditional apparel as well, but he continues to be Kwesi Butri, who continues to give such disturb, distinguished service to our nation. Like me, he's not done yet. <laughs> We see your welcome, and now you go. Uh, and I'm happy that today, both of us who began our youth as fellow Marxists, <laughs> are united in our support of the market economy. OK, I bet you haven't seen the president laugh like that again. You want to see that one more time? OK. Are <laughs> 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 uh, united in our support of the market economy. 